Thank you very much, Professor McCoy, for your comprehensive presentations. Actually, when I read your uh, article you know, based on 11 country studies, only uh, the Philippines and Thailand uh, are included. And, and uh, we have uh, India and, and, and South Korea today, but they are not included. So I'm very much excited to hear you know, what the, the panelists are uh, thinking about their country case. Um, so let me introduce uh, speakers, panelists first. Uh, from South Korea, uh, Professor Jung Kim at University of North Korean Studies. And also uh, Jung is serving as a regional coordinator of ADRN. And second presenter is uh, Professor uh, Francis Magno. And he's a director of uh, uh, the C. Roberto Institute of Governance at the uh, De La Sala University of Philippines. And so the panelist from India is uh, Dr. Niranjan Sahu, is a senior fellow at Observer Research Foundation. And also Niranjan is also serving ADLN as a one of regional coordinator. And, and lastly, and uh, uh, Ms. Janjira Somba Punsri, and she's an assistant professor at the Chularongkon University. So welcome and thank you for uh, joining this webinar. Um, let me ask uh, the basic questions. Already uh, Professor McCoy has uh, explained kind of interaction uh, between a more existing lifts uh, and, and, and versus uh, kind of uh, agencies, uh, political strategies, and, and uh, Professor McCoy uh, more you know, emphasize agency matters over structure. So it's really the political entrepreneur's strategy to gain or concentrate the power is important. So I'd like to ask you, uh, you know, what kind of agencies? It can be political parties, it can be a new populist leaders, and it can be both. And also media, of course, will play a very important role. And also when you assess this political polarization, I'm sure countries are all different. Um, maybe it's not that high, like existential you know, hatred between two camps like you can find in America of today. So uh, I'd like to ask, uh, you know, how, and also what kind of issues and narratives are focusing on and, and this, uh, the, when they try to, to you know, differentiate us uh, versus them, which issues matters and, and is it sustainable or just temporary? So all these exciting questions. So let me invite Professor Chung Kim first. Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, having me in, in this timely and very interesting as well as important issue uh, for the uh, democratic development in general, and the say um, how how we can we can say deter some some uh, pernicious polarization uh, trend in the country or at the at the global level here. So here I want to uh, make some report for the uh, political polarization uh, and its impact on democracy in the case of South Korea. So um, uh, I'm very fortunate to have uh, very good quality data to uh, evaluate uh, some, some first and previous structures of political polarization in South Korea and, and even we can have two point uh, time serial data. And uh, I uh, report uh, the previous structure uh, identified in the 2012 presidential election. And then I'm, I'm also uh, showing the outcome in 2012. 22, uh, the, the presidential election, so that we can see some uh, temporal change in terms of creepy structures, as well as the uh, intensity or increasing or decreasing level of polarization uh, between these 
uh, 10 years. So as you can see in, in the left side, the uh, graph, uh, this is the basically the differences between uh, a, in, a, in a category, uh, the differences uh, between the portion of left supporter, left party supporters, and, and as well as the uh, the right party supporters. So if the, the value is negative, then that means, for example, progressives are strongly aligned with uh, left parties. And if the value is positive, then for example, the conservatives are uh, very strongly aligned with uh, right parties. So uh, this uh, graph, uh, could show me, uh, show us that the uh, which cleavages are, say, uh, intensely, uh, say, politicized, but uh, which uh, cleavages are not here. So, based on our data, uh, though, I think I think the most important and and severe uh, cleavages would be so-called ideological privileges. So here, progressives uh, very strongly aligned with left party uh, and the conservatives are somehow uh, strongly aligned with right party. So uh, in South Korea in, in 2012, ideological privileges are one of the most salient uh, one here. At the same time, uh, Gwangju, Jeonbuk, Jeonnam versus Daegu, Gyeongbuk. Uh, so this is some, some uh, unique uh, regional privileges in South Korea. And uh, since the, uh, the inception of democratization, uh, these regional privileges tend to be somehow uh, getting weaker, but still, still it's one of the most important privilege structure of uh, polarization, even in 2012 here. And uh, the third uh, important privileges would be generational one here. So here, as you can see, the voters on the 30 uh, versus uh, voters over 60 uh, show very contrasting uh, voting choices here. So uh, basically uh, we can uh, find that in 2012, uh, ideological privileges, regional privileges, and generational privileges, those are uh, most important privilege structures of South Korea. And say uh, occupational privileges can be identified somehow, somehow the, the uh, salient, but uh, these uh, privileges are just disappearing in, in 2012. And here, as you can see, ideological privileges are getting stronger. So progressive versus conservatives now much more polarized in their uh, voting choice. At the same time, regional privileges are still maintain its strengths in, in dividing borders between left and right party. At the same time, the generational privileges, now it's somehow uh, the most important privileges are different. Before that, as you, you have seen, the under 30, voters under 30 versus over 60, that's, that's the privileges. But here, 40s versus over 60, voters over 60 is, is now constitute the main uh, uh, generational privileges here. And for the matter of polarization as a political strategy of parties, uh, I just disaggregate uh, the political polarization uh, into three different dimensions. Uh, first one is ideological polarization. And this is basically ideology in general here. So it's, it's left or right thing here. The second dimension is uh, programmatic polarization. So this is the polarization at the level of policy differentiation. Uh, in, South, in, in the case of South Korea, uh, whether the voters uh, support some engagement policy with North Korea or the containment of North Korea, these are the one of the most important uh, policy differentiation issue here. And lastly, I think the this is somehow very well jived uh, with the uh, Professor McCoy's the pernicious polarization, which I, I think effective dimension of polarization. 
here I, I measure the, the uh, those who think the favorable of the left party versus unfavorable left party and, and how they can uh, pit against each other here. And, and at the same time, uh, voters favorable right party and unfavorable right, uh, right party here. So as you can see, uh, ideological polarization, progressive versus conservative, it's, it's very strongly um, the, the divided here. At the same time, in, in 2012, programmatic polarization here, somehow its, its strength is not that big. So minus 14 versus plus 37. So that's, that's not a big issue here. So policy differentiation is not a big uh, issue of polarization. But uh, at the same time, effective polarization here uh, for the right party, uh, favorable or unfavorable, that's, that's somehow uh, intense uh, differences. But for those who think favorable left party or unfavorable left party, there's some, some smaller level of polarization. But this picture in 2012 hugely uh, transformed into higher level of polarization. So in terms of ideological polarization, it's the, the, the gap is increased. And in terms of programmatic polarization, also the degree of the uh, pulse differentiation is also getting bigger and bigger. And finally, we have found out that effective polarization is getting worse and worse. So in, in here's ideology as an identity uh, in, in South Korea is the main source for uh, making, say, the political polarization uh, would be very harmful for the development of democracy in South Korea. So in that sense, um, here, as Professor McCoy uh, indicated, I also use the uh, pro political polarization from the Freedom uh, data set. And this is the 2000, 21 uh, the uh, measurement and as you can see South Korea uh, the political polarization is 2.69 in, in among the 38 OECD member countries it's ranked uh, 11th so somehow higher than median value but as you can see uh, the highest or higher level of the uh, political polarization, the countries with the political polarization, Turkey, Poland, Hungary, Mexico, Colombia, they are examples of democratic breakdown. And at the same time, Slovenia and the United States, we can observe the democratic backsliding. So uh, I don't think the South Korea is some, somehow safe case for the democratic development. Uh, instead, what we have found in 2000, 22 presidential election, uh, possibly the South Korea is now just entry point of so-called pernicious polarization, which will be uh, very harmful on the future of, uh, say, democratic politics in South Korea. So that's, that's what I have found from the data. Thank you, Professor Jung Kim. Uh, he analyzed the 10 year the, the kind of uh, change and he emphasized the ideological and also policy platform, especially the North Korea policy and also effective, I think it's a, the, the warm up feeling toward each party uh, have been wide, uh, widened over uh, the, the 10 years. Uh, and he worries about uh, maybe South Korea will face pernicious polarization in the near future, even though our uh, democracy uh, achievement score is still very high globally. Uh, okay, thank you. And let me invite uh, Francisco. Uh, Philippines is also very much polarized country. So uh, without further ado, Francisco, it's your turn. Thank you, Professor Sut Kyung. And thank you, Professor Jennifer McCoy for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, let me start by saying that the cleavage structures of political polarization in the Philippines in recent, year, recent years have been shaped 
by the rise of authoritarian populism with the election of President Rodrigo Duterte in the 2016 elections. This populist campaign strategy leveraged mass media and social media and thereby allowed Duterte to appeal to Filipinos over the heads of the country's powerful political clans. He centered this presidential campaign on an anti-establishment and law and order message, casting himself as the champion of the people against the oligarchs. Uh, coming from the southern, uh, southern part of the Philippines, uh, Davo, a mayor of Davao City, he presented himself as an outsider and uh, provided a message that the Philippines has been ruled by the elites based in, in what he called Imperial Manila. In the months before the election, Duterte began to campaign aggressively on the issue of drug-related criminality. So he projected uh, the drug problem as a very serious problem. Although based on data, uh, the Philippines is among the maybe countries that are not really affected very much by a drug problem. Uh, in terms of percentage, uh, it's less than 2% of the population are affected. But when he assumed power, Duterte launched a drug war through to his promise. The program was criticized for violating human rights and engaging in extrajudicial, extrajudicial killings. Opponents of the drug war were punished. A senator was put into jail on Trump up charges. The chief of justice of the Supreme Court was removed from office. The Commission on Human Rights was threatened with the zero budget allocation. President Duterte thrived in a climate of insulting critics and bashing independent, independent media reporting. The legislative franchise of a leading television and radio broadcast firm was not renewed. The chief executive of an online news platform was slapped with a libel case. As a result, media practitioners have turned to self-regulation. Independent civil society have been silenced by a combination of official intimidation and bashing in social media. Given the government's lack of tolerance for contrary opinions, the quality of political deb debate and discussions hit rock bottom. So that has been the effect of uh, simplification. So instead of, uh, of debates on the critical issues, it became the us versus them a binary situation. The democratic erosion have also provided fertile ground for the growth of an ecosystem of disinformation. Disinformation through the propagation of conspiracy theories in digital environments is concerned with the systematic disruption of information channels caused by strategic deception and consumed by a targeted segment of a population to advance a particular political agenda. So social media became a battleground. It may come in the form of fake news stories or simulated documentary formats that can appear credible. The contrived content is generated by multiple actors, including state and private actors who utilize bots, trolls, fake accounts, websites, and social media influencers. So the, the, so, the so-called social media influencers who came out during election period, they continued on with their jobs uh, even after the electoral period. However, unlike in highly polarized countries, the ideological, religious, and socioeconomic cleavages do not overlap. Political rivalries continue to be based largely on personality and faction rather than on ideology or identity. Maybe we can, uh, we can uh, attribute this to the weakness of the political party system in the country. Uh, there is, uh, we have the absence of a strong political party law, so political turncoatism 
or party switching is very prevalent. Whoever wins as president, uh, politicians from various parties would transfer to the party of the president. Uh, maybe it also uh, an, a critical factor is the fact that uh, the Philippine president is good only for one term, a term of six years. There is no re-election. But what we have to look here would be the so-called continuity candidate. So we are having an election this coming May. And so uh, there is a lot of the, uh, the president has not, who remains very popular at this time, has not endorsed uh, a candidate even though his uh, daughter is running for vice president. So uh, th that, is, uh, that is something that is being uh, looked or obs observed very closely by uh, political analysts. During the Marcos presidency, the cleaving of both the elite and the masses into pro and anti-Marcos factions could be seen as evidence of intense polarization as region, ideology, and interests all momentarily aligned to form a grand cleavage. But this is because uh, Ferdinand Marcos Sr. declared martial law. And uh, aside from serving his, uh, his term as elected president from 1965, uh, winning another term in 1970, uh, in 1969, we used to have a four-year term with one re-election. He declared martial law uh, a year before the end of his second term. So that he was able to continue for another 14 years until he was, he was removed through a, a people's power revolution. So this is not the case in, in, in the, the 30 case because he is good only for one term. And this is his last year. He's, fine. He's serving his final months in office. But uh, what is interesting is uh, that the son of the uh, former uh, president, Ferdinand Marcos, is running for elections. Uh, his name is also Ferdinand Marcos Jr. So they have the same names. But uh, he is actually the front runner in the 20, uh, 2022 elections, the, the May 9 elections. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, battles being fought in social media. Actually, uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. He was a former senator. Narrowly, narrowly lost in the 2016 vice presidential elections. So he is returning as now as a candidate for president. So I would say that uh, Duterte, uh, President Duterte, while having prominent domestic critics, there was no persistent anti-Duterte bloc that was formed. Opposition political parties remain weak, and Duterte has managed to retain a high popularity rating even in his last months in office. So I would stop here, uh, and I have some, some more notes for the second question. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, I think uh, the case of Philippines is a very uh, you know, classic case that you have a very weak uh, political party system. So uh, suddenly the populist leader Duterte has used uh, the, the, the drug war issues, which is not fundamental uh, cleavage uh, issues, right? Uh, so I am wondering, uh, since you know, he, will, he cannot be a president any longer and after the May election, uh, maybe you, I, I wonder if there will be another the president uh, who can you know, use this weak political party system to, to uh, uh, you know, expand uh, the political polarization. In that case, the interpretation of martial law in the past can be an issue. You, know, you can answer in the second round. 
Okay, and then let's move it to India. Oh, this is a very, <laughs> you know, focus of uh, discussion for the democracy scholars because of uh, your Prime Minister Modi. So, uh, Niranjan, please. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'll just uh, run a short uh, uh, slide. Uh, are you able to see? Yes, we can see. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, uh, uh, Sukjang, for organizing this. Uh, in, in fact, uh, uh, this is something uh, uh, you know we have been thinking to have it actually because of the COVID actually things really got uh, <clears throat> messed up, uh, but better late than never. And uh, also thanks for getting uh, uh, Professor Je Jennifer Michael, whose uh, work I've been actually following. Uh, to be honest, actually, I uh, uh, got to know about her work actually uh, with a project we did uh, in 2018 with uh, Thomas Carather and, you know, uh, 10 of us, uh, you know, for a book project. Uh, and I, I, in fact, Tom actually started sharing some of her actually writing even before her book got published. We we had uh, some of those, so we are the beneficiary in some sense. And 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 and, and glad that you spoke, uh, uh, you know. And uh, those twenty minutes uh, gave us a uh, fascinating kind of you no know, short uh, journey about you know how how uh, this uh, particular aspect is uh, you know impacting the quality of democracy and India is uh, today, in fact, uh, I would say uh, the things, uh, some of those things that uh, uh, Professor uh, Macri captured, uh, especially the issue of, uh, you know, those cleavages, uh, uh, the national identity questions uh, is, is basically uh, where, you know, India's uh, severe political pol polarization actually stand today. Uh, it's about the identity of the nationhood, you know, that uh, which, which has a uh, pre-colonial uh, route, uh, in fact, starting with the British time. So I'll just uh, run uh, seven, eight slides uh, quickly in 10 minutes time. Uh, I don't know whether I'll be able to manage, but I'll just give a sort of uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, attempt actually. So uh, so one thing, uh, what uh, I mean, I've uh, tried to capture all the three questions uh, that were you know given to us, uh, uh, looking at uh, the uh, roots, uh, the trajectories, and you know, then what are the impacts, and what what are the steps actually uh, countries are you know taking uh, in terms of you know addressing uh, this uh, polarization. So in in Indian case, actually, uh, like uh, India is a very very you know uh, deeply diverse uh, plural country, and we have uh, caste, uh, religion, you know, language, uh, regional all kind of, you know, uh, sort of uh, 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 cleavages. Uh, but though those, they have been exist, they are, you know, in existence for uh, centuries. Then I, I think none of them actually really uh, created a position of, you know, kind of ours versus them. People generally coexist with all the differences. But one particular aspect that is about the issue of national identity, you know, that uh, uh, has been a defining feature of you know uh, uh, India's polarization, in, especially in the last uh, uh, 20 years. Uh, that polarization, what we are experiencing today, is basically uh, uh, although it has a uh, sort of colonial root, but it actually goes to the politics of you know uh, 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 late 90s, where it all started with the question of you know Indian uh, uh, national identity, that idea of India, which is secular, uh, plural India of uh, Gandhi and uh, Nehru, the first prime minister, versus the Hindu right uh, idea of, you know, a sort of uh, uh, Hindu nation, you know, a sort of uh, theocratic state in which the Hindus will have the first right on anything. So that's typical, like, you know, uh, a kind of, you know, Pakistani version of, you know, sort of uh, Hindu Rashtra. Uh, now, looking at the historical roots of, uh, you know, this uh, uh, particular polarizations, uh, uh, as I said, uh, it has a pre-colonial root. You know, when uh, Gandhi was, you know, fighting the freedom for this country, he was trying to get uh, both Hindus, Muslim, you know, all of them together and provide a kind of inclusive vision of India. And, uh, but then that actually led to, uh, the, especially the Hindu right, uh, like uh, people like uh, Vidi uh, Savarkar, uh, you know, those who are actually also freedom fighters, to question that, you know, why should... Uh, uh, 
uh, not the Hindu be given the first, uh, you know, sort of right over this nation because for centuries this has been a uh, country of, you know, uh, largely of Hindus and Hindu have been attacked by successive, you know, Muslim rulers. So he basically created a binary and he basically propagated uh, with, uh, you know, other Hindu uh, uh, sister organizations like uh, Rashtriya Sevak Song, you know, which is, is a sister organization of uh, uh, current uh, party, ruling party, that is uh, Bharatiya Janta Party, uh, headed by Mr. Modi. So, so they, they are actually formed a kind of, you know, uh, another uh, kind of uh, uh, sort of a vision of a nation, which uh, was in contrast with what Gandhi Nehru, you know, proposed. Uh, uh, so that actually, uh, in somehow other thing, you know, uh, remained still in the periphery because uh, Gandhi was a towering personality, and Nehru, who succeeded uh, and became the first prime minister, was very secular. And uh, he uh, his towering personality also ensured that you know the Hindu right didn't get any kind of you know uh, sort of uh, uh, platform, you know, to uh, create the, this kind of cleavages and you know uh, accentuate it. So, so for, for several decades, actually, they remained in the periphery. Uh, but uh, with the country's politics changing, you know, over the years, uh, gradually, you know, these groups uh, who were in the fringes became also, uh, came to the mainstream. And I'll actually go that uh, in the next uh, couple of slides. So, so basically, uh, as I said, Congress party, which uh, was the uh, party of the freedom movement, uh, you know, like in many countries, you'll find where you have that colonial struggle and, you know, those parties, uh, generally uh, dominates for fast few you know decades so congress party uh, dominated for several decades almost 1947 to 1980 it was a hegemonic uh, kind of party and because that party also gave put premium on you know sort of secular and uh, you know inclusive india idea of india so uh, the right wing uh, uh, groups actually didn't get much you know chance although they were you know constantly trying to uh, create the divide and you know uh, Push their agenda, uh, but they, they 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 were never in the mainstream. Uh, but what happened actually in 1980 uh, when uh, the new political party was formed, uh, that is Bharatiya Janata Party, which is uh, in power today. So 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 1980 became a turning point of in uh, country's politics, and and that is uh, this uh, Bharatiya Janata Party, which was formed in uh, 1980, basically to take off uh, Hindu rights, you know, sort of uh, issues they actually started questioning the Congress vision of India. And, and uh, Congress, uh, to some extent, also had uh, policy, you know, followed a policy of minority appeasement, like, you know, providing certain uh, benefits for the minority group, like Muslims or Christians and other things. So they try, started, you know, uh, ventilating them and using them, you know, for their sort of, uh, as an opening. Uh, and of course, they, they, they also found uh, uh, sort of issues which uh, uh, the Congress party also created on its own, basically, to also... Uh, uh, get the uh, uh, you know votes of the majority Hindus uh, in a sense that uh, uh, Ram Temple you know which became a major rallying point for the divide later on uh, uh, it was actually that entire opening was started by the Rajiv Gandhi government that Congress government in the uh, late 80s so that gave an opening for the BJP you know the Hindu right party and then uh, uh, that still was not enough actually for them to uh, you know, like uh, uh, getting to the center stage. But what happened actually in the uh, early 90s, uh, uh, after, the, you know, Hindu rights actually uh, went on the mass mobilization and, you know, getting uh, especially Hindus to build that Ram temple, uh, you know, in which it was a disputed uh, sort of a place in which uh, over a temple, uh, a uh, mosque was built by the, uh, you know, uh, Mughal emperor Baba. And that had become an issue for several centuries. But uh, finally, the Hindu right actually uh, had the mobilizational success and they demolished that mosque, uh, which led to, you know, a series of riots, uh, communal rights in the country. But that uh, gave an opening for the Hindu right to capture political power later on, uh, using religion as a card, you know, sort of way. Uh, so so, uh, so, so uh, BJP came to power with, you know, playing the religion card and, you know, that uh, divide, you know, that uh, religious divide, that Hindu nationalism card. Uh, and later on, uh, uh, you know, that had uh, that sort of uh, impact uh, that BJP had uh, got reduced largely because then the, uh, again, the, you know, caste cleavages, you know, ethnic cleavages, other thing, you know, came to the prominence. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, so people thought that, you know, that uh, whatever polarization based on religion we had is actually thing of past. But then 
that was that was actually uh, uh, you know that was for a short while uh, until uh, you know someone like narendra modi who is basically seen as a you know hindu nationalist and a sort of uh, uh, hardcore uh, sort of uh, you know unapologetic advocate of uh, hindu uh, uh, sort of uh, hegemony or dominance so he basically uh, uh, came and you know uh, made a sort of a issue in 2014 uh, uh, you know general elections and and he captured the power for the first time bjp with a full majority and then actually the entire landscape uh, started changing and the polarization took a very sharp and ugly turn uh, so uh, so basically uh, this is what the trajectory you know the history has been and uh, in terms of key drivers uh, uh, one thing that actually had uh, you know helped uh, you know bjp to rise is basically the economic transformation in india experience in the 1991 when the country's economy you know opened and uh, and and it created a substantial middle class urban population and they are basically uh, most of this urban population and uh, the middle class are basically pro uh, you know uh, bjp and they are basically you know in many ways sympathetic to hindu nationalism so that actually gave bjp uh, you know sort of uh, a voting block which it was it was lacking in the other decades so that was you know economic transformation has in it can be seen in many countries where you you see polarization that economic transformation also aids in some or other polarization so india case it actually helped uh, the polarization to get more sharp uh, uh, and then second thing is also caste dynamics which had earlier uh, checked the polarization you know political polarization because there are you know within the hindu group there are uh, several you know different caste group and they fight each other so so that had actually uh, you know uh, help that you know there will be no polarization or somebody cannot just uh, consolidate all the caste group and you know win but bjp was able to manage uh, to bypass that by using a religion card that you know uh, hindu hindus are you know to be united or the things so in a, in a sense bjp was able to overcome that caste divide within the hindu uh, religion so that was also another uh, sort of uh, driver Uh, the third driver is you know which some of uh, my uh, other colleague also said about the social media the technology also fuel uh, sort of uh, uh, divisions because uh, bjp is able to utilize the uh, technology the social media uh, uh, space uh, more effectively for mobilization for propaganda for uh, peddling misinformation so in a sense if you see Uh, bjp the ruling party is uh, way ahead from other uh, political parties in terms of you know its uh, misinformation propaganda and and creating a narrative that you know it is fighting for the hindu uh, consolidation for hindu revival and and that way it has succeeded to even get uh, some of the people who are very very educated and well placed uh, including in in fact that debate is today in uh, the lot of uh, nris in the us who have been also sharply divided you know in terms of supporting the narendra modi government here so so we have a peculiar situation uh, and the consequences uh, i'll just take one or two minutes consequences are very uh, you know uh, uh, easy to see uh, like what uh, professor macko has said uh, we have a situation like ors versus them has become very sharp political divide used to be always there but uh, it, it is uh, so sharp now that they have stopped calling each other you know in the parliament even opposition leader and the ruling party prime minister they don't talk to each other and they don't see to each other it has become almost a zero sum game so that binary like national versus anti national you know uh, is uh, uh, a sharper ever actually uh, the second consequence is the cultural intolerance and this is most uh, 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 dangerous in the sense that you know the social fabric is breaking Uh, there is uh, you know hate crime committed against you know minorities and certain group who are you know political opponent and in lot of cases these are happening actually with state impunity you know sort of support uh, uh, then also the another consequence is the hardening of you know identity politics uh, now uh, uh, openly you know the uh, ruling party is openly using the religion card uh, uh, the temple issue the ayodhya you know temple establishment and you know all kind of things and the problem is that you know opposition you know uh, 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 rather than you know coming out with a sort of alternative agenda or vision is actually now thinking that you know the ruling party is gaining because of using religion card so they have also started uh, employing the religion you know card to fight it but it has become a more like a competitive hindutva uh, so uh, which is actually in many way uh, is harmful for the minorities because uh, even the mainstream opposition parties are not actually 
willing to take up the minority causes because they fear that this will actually mean they will not get the votes from the majority community. And then uh, Liga Shivar, you know, who owns the nation, you know, who owns the history of this nation, there is a huge fight uh, over that, rewriting of the history, uh, attacking and weakening the institutions, these uh, independent institutions, including election commission, even judiciary at, uh, are, are at the receiving end, actually. And some of those institutions have been directly attacked. Uh, uh, there has been mistrust also because of polarization, because opposition don't think that, you know, judiciary is really standing up to the executive or the ruling party. So there is, uh, that, that's also a major uh, consequences. Uh, and uh, of course, now there is a politicization of uh, national security also. If the BJP ruling party is doing something, then that is also colored in a sense that, you know, they are doing it for vote bank, uh, like, you know, Hindu terror, Saffron terror, and all, all kinds of things, uh, jihadi. Uh, uh, and of course, the uh, biggest consequences is the major trainism, you know, which is actually rising. In the last eight years, major trainism has reached its peak, actually, with all kinds of consequences, you know, which uh, in many ways has uh, ensured that there is a collapse of, you know, trust and inter-community relationship which is uh, very sad because this country used to be such an inclusive and, you know, sort of uh, plural country in which, you know, people used to, with, there used to be uh, minor, you know, classes and, you know, communal rights once in a while, but people used to go along, you know, very well. That is actually is breaking, that social fabric, uh, that political capital is, uh, yeah. and the final thing is uh, what sort of efforts, uh, like uh, in India, uh, to reduce the polarizations, you know, there have been efforts by, the judiciary to a great extent to reduce restrain the head speech by the ruling party and politicians by sometimes you know pulling them off and you know issuing sort of uh, uh, punishment but that hasn't actually really deterred because uh, uh, politicians see that they are profiting from head speech so better to you know uh, carry on they have incentive to do that and opposition are still you know uh, quite often trying to form a united bloc to check the BJP right wing, you know, policies and it's uh, sort of a polarizing, you know, strategy, but they have not also succeeded because uh, the ruling party is using their weaknesses in different way by using state instrument, you know, like income tax rate and all kinds of things. Uh, social, uh, uh, civil society has been quite active and to some extent civil society has able to uh, stop uh, in many uh, cases like, you know, uh, in 2019, we saw a very spirited protest on citizenship issue. There was a bill uh, on, you know, citizenship issue in which, you know, Muslims were, you know, uh, uh, excluded from citizenship rights. So, but then uh, uh, Muslim women actually uh, put up a very spirited campaign in that famous Sain Bagh uh, protest, and that led to government suspending, you know, those uh, laws. It is not implementing. And we have also far more protests, which forced the government to also take back certain laws, actually. So these, uh, I think, uh, among uh, the lot, civil society has made, a, made an impact. But uh, many other institutions, like in the federal uh, institutions or media, other things, have been complete failure. And that's where, actually, we are positioned in a very precariously position. Uh, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Nyanja, because you included in a kind of the polarizing efforts as well. So your, your talks <laughs> went to a little bit longer. Um, I think uh, it's a very difficult case because you have a religion-based national identity and you have a very strong populist prime minister and also uh, the party, his party is very strong, controlling 56% of uh, your parliament seats. On the other hand, the, the opposition party, the biggest one is uh, only taking less than 10%. So I think it's a very difficult case. And now we are entering maybe a more challenging case to Thailand because uh, we already you know, remind yellow shirts and uh, red shirts. And so yeah, so Janjira, and she's gonna, uh, present uh, very, this very difficult, challenging case of uh, Thailand's uh, political polarization. Sanjira? Hi, um, morning from Berlin. So um, I'd like to thank um, Professor Sukjong um, and the network for inviting me to this very fascinating and timely panel. And also thank you, uh, Professor Jennifer, for um, her very um, important and um, comprehensive presentation on the topic. And so my presentation today is based 
on my chapter in the edited volume on political polarization in Asia, published by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in 2020. And I think um, Niranjan also um, uh, wrote a chapter in that as well. And so Thailand, um, as Professor Suk Jong said, um, is, is a tough case um, and it's actually, actually a representative case for the interplay between polarization and autocratization. But first, um, let me start by addressing processes of polarization um, in Thailand first, and I think, I think that uh, later we will return to the question of autocratization or um, democratic backsliding. And so at the heart of Thailand's entrenched polarization is the sharp division between supporters of two political orders. These are royal nationalism and democracy. The two camps persistently dispute over the notions of sovereignty. Royal nationalism that underpins Thailand's political and ideological establishment associates sovereignty with the monarchy, if not the king himself. For this reason, any political regimes, including monarchy, must be subsumed under the rule of the monarchy a position that has historically been contested by the Democrats, who actually argue that sovereignty should belong to the people. Those um, markedly different conceptions of sovereignty also shape uh, collective identities in Thailand. And so for royal nationalists, the monarchy is the basis of the Thai nation and tradition, and so the respect of the institution for the institution defines what it means to be a Thai person. In contrast, the Democrats espouse um, egalitarian values. And so this makes it difficult for them to accept inherent social hierarchy that accompanies the monarchical rule. So um, I'm just going to go briefly into the historical fault lines between the two camps. Um, and um, this has developed in three phases. So the first was Thailand's unfinished regime transition in 1932, when the Democrats emerged to challenge the royal nationalist order, but this democratic revolution was later unraveled. The second phase lasted from the 60s to the 80s, when the military in tandem with the palace consolidated royal nationalism in the face of calls for democratization and communist challenges. The establishment, however, survived these threats and even thrive uh, by adapting to a political and economic liberalization in the 90s. The late King Kumipon, for instance, um, incorporated some liberal elements into royal nationalism, but nonetheless preserve anti-democratic domains to protect um, royal interests. The third and um, recent phase of this ideological struggle emerged in the early 2000s in light of globalization and modernization nexus. These latest political conflicts played out both in um, institutional politics and on the streets, in which supporters of each camp contested the legitimacy of governments representing the opposing camp. Yeah? The elite allies of um, royal um, nationalist bloc in particular possessed um, greater in institutional and military leverage um, than the other side of the aisle, um, just like uh, Professor Jennifer just said. Um, and this has led to successes in toppling um, um, elected governments that uh, represented the anti-establishment cap. In terms of actors driving polarization in Thailand, um, these actors have fluctuated over time actually, um, but if I am to overlook the nuances for a minute, I would say that supporters of the royal nationalist camp comprise, um, of course, the monarchy, um, the military and their allies in the bureaucracy, especially in the courts and private sector. And of course, ordinary people who love and respect the monarchy. Um, actors within the democratic camp consist of anti-establishment politicians who have been empowered by um, the 90s, um, democratic opening, pro-democracy activists, uh, academics, and lately um, students. 
And um, um, as showed in um, the protest in 2020 um, onward, um, Generation C, actually um, students that are in high school and um, university at the moment, um, have been at the forefront of the struggle against the establishment. And therefore, now we start to have a new cleavage, uh, which is generational cleavage that um, defines this uh, polarization in Thailand. So in terms of narratives, the ideological um, contestation over the preferred form of governance shape the moral discourse of the um, establishment supporters who consider elected politicians as corrupt, democracy as chaotic, and um, voters in rural areas as uneducated and thus easily misled by what buying politicians. And therefore, because of this discourse, and I, I guess we have time to talk about this, how this actually undermined the democratic order in Thailand, makes it very difficult to reverse autocratization process in the country. Um, another element of the narrative, which is very important, is um, that um, the anti-establishment supporters are often seen as um, anti-monarchy, and because the monarchy defies the Thai nation, therefore being anti-monarchy also implies um, being nation haters, that, the, that is the term used um, by conservatives in Thailand. And in, in India, I guess the term is anti-nation, right? And so this discourse has been used to mobilize um, supporters um, of uh, um, the royalist camp. And on the other hand, for the um, anti-establishment supporters, um, royalists are generally um, associated with um, supporters of uh, a backward rule, um, sometimes fascism, militarism, and urban snobbishness. Um, and because of this, the, the love of the monarchy for anti-establishment supporters um, is blind, um, reflecting at times their unintelligence. And this is the narrative, it's not my opinion, just so you know. Um, and um, because of this um, um, uh, understanding, I think at times on part of the anti-establishment supporters, there seem to be a lack of empathy and understanding as to why um, supporters of the royalist camp uh, still love and respect the monarchy. Um, so um, the second point, which I think will be very brief, um, elites from both sides have instrumentalized polarization, especially during the tit for tat mobilizations in Thailand from 2005 to 2015. And as mentioned, the establishment elites, especially the palace and the army, have um, devised um, royal nationalism to drive protests against governments that represented um, the anti-establishment forces. And so the same ideology in turn provided a pretext for two military coups in 2006 and 14. Coup makers also made use of polarization as a justification to rule um, in the name of peace and harmony um, and to suppress dissidents alleged to so, um, as I said, uh, social disharmony. Um, at the same time, military backed cyber troopers, cyber trolls, often spread this information regarding actors within the anti establishment camp that they attempt to overthrow the monarchy and thus reaffirming the royalist um, narrative that sustained polarization. Similar to the um, um, establishment elites, um, anti-establishment politicians in the past use um, the call to defend democracy and egalitarian discourse to galvanize mass demonstrations against the um, establishment elites. Um, the narratives were particularly uh, powerful and well-received, especially in the aftermath of the military coups or um, violent crackdown on um, anti-establishment protesters. Last but not least, um, public reception of these divisive narratives that I described above also have, uh, has fluctuated over time, especially depending on public perception of the legitimacy of the monarchy. Um, I would say in general, they are active receptors and producers of the narratives who are activists and influencers on both camps, right? So these are the so-called extremist um, um, actors that Professor um, Jennifer just um, sort of explained early on. 
Um, the onlookers, like those in between these two extreme ends, um, sometimes feel um, fed up, sometimes feel carried away by the narratives, especially when it, it is related to the monarchy. For instance, um, because of the late King Pumipon was highly revered among many Thais, um, royalist elites used to um, kind of uh, uh, use his image to mobilize uh, popular support of his political cause, right? But things were different. Um, um, in 2020, for example, when um, the protests emerged for years after the late king passed away and we had now a new king. So protesters' criticisms of the royal institution somehow gained some traction um, in 2020 and actually that shows some changing public opinions in Thailand. And of course, there was some pushback uh, from royalist supporters and harsh repression from the government, but still there seems to be some change in public legitimacy towards the monarchy. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Shanjira. So T4 Tet mobilization in Thailand is a very dynamic and valid. Uh, however, you have military, right? <laughs> they can stop everything. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. uh, since uh, time is limited, I would like to ask John Kim and, and Francis Magno about the kind of uh, institutional or civil society efforts to uh, reduce, tame the widening political polarization. Uh, John? Briefly, yeah. Yeah, so um, say in Sanskrit, a uh, uh, major agency of political politician uh, must be political parties. And, and this political party is the strategy to mobilize and counter mobilize, or the, as Gendra said, is tit, tit for tat, uh, the mobilization is the key to understand why the political polarization is so getting severe. In, in, the, in, the, in the context of the South Korean uh, party politics. At the same time, uh, the civil society organization, once it is some, some uh, say, protector of some uh, integrity of some, some democratic forces, now uh, itself divides into two uh, political camps. One is the progressive, another is conservative. So, Basically, uh, in, in South Korea, we, we just uh, are losing some guardrail to protect uh, some, some uh, minimum level of the integrity of some neutral and capable uh, civil society organization that can uh, hinder some, some progress of the uh, political propagation. So that's why uh, I I'm, I'm, I'm have to say uh, the some, some pernicious uh captures the very sense uh, and, and perilous uh, state of democracy in South Korea. Okay, Francis, how about in Philippines? Uh, like in South Korea, there is no uh, unifiers, you know, who can mediate these two camps? Uh, yeah, what, uh, what's happening in the Philippines is the formation of a coalition of uh, civil society organizations uh, together with other groups, including universities, uh, independent, independent media organizations doing uh, uh, fact checking because of the proliferation of uh, fake news, fake accounts, uh, especially in the run up to the elections. Uh, we noticed that uh, the uh, proliferation of these fake uh, social media accounts, they become more prominent during election season. And uh, currently uh, we, we are the Philippines is in an election season. We uh, today is the start of the local campaign. Uh, we we have an ongoing national campaign uh, for for the general elections of May nine. Uh, so some examples of these organizations are the Consortium on Democracy and Disinformation. Uh, there is a, a movement against misinformation. Uh, I mentioned a while ago that there have been moves to really revise history. Uh, for example, the history of martial law, uh, considering that uh, the, the son of the former president, Marcos, is running for president. And uh, his campaign is really based on uh, 
presenting the martial law period in the Philippines, the 14 years of martial law as the golden age of Philippine, uh, Philippine, demo, uh, Philippine history and uh, Philippine economic growth. So uh, basically whitewashing the economic plunder and uh, all the corruption and uh, ill-gotten wealth. And this is uh, rather effective for, for the Marcoses because uh, the, the son of the uh, late dictator is now the current uh, front runner in the elections by a huge margin uh, based on the recent uh, survey. Although we are still waiting for the next survey to come out in, uh, in the next three weeks, but we, we have to see. So uh, the, the polarization is happening. It's like uh, going back to the uh, period of uh, martial law where there was so much polarization uh, with uh, 14 years of martial law an opposition uh, block was formed uh, to contest, uh, to, uh, to fight the dictatorship. So it, it appears that the, the main political rift right now, polarization is between those uh, uh, who are defending uh, liberal democracy and those who are uh, promoting authoritarianism as an alternative. Um, maybe not calling it authoritarianism, uh, democracy with very strong authoritarian features. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, Professor McCoy, you uh, have heard the uh, cases from four countries, right? And, and I think uh, the major issues and also the agencies and also party, uh, the balance of party power in the parliament and also the social mobilization, supporters mobilization are very different. So uh, you have studied many countries. So uh, you know, comparing with the, the, the similar cases, what kind of suggestions you like to give uh, to uh, depolarize uh, the these four uh, societies in these four countries? Yeah, thanks. Um, yes, yeah, they're very different cases, and I think what we have is. You know, the South Korea, as we've seen, it's more at the warning level, um, not yet uh, eroding democratically, but polarization um, rising. And so my question on that one would be, I, I thought it was very alarming what Jung Kim just said about civil society that had provided guardrails now polarizing themselves. And uh, but I also wanted to ask about the party, because as I understand, civil society and a bipartisan consensus came together in 2016 to work on the impeachment and to protect democracy. And so if we're losing both the civil society um, and, and what about, you know, the political parties in terms of defending society, because that's, that's really the key, the, the main, um, you know, recommendation is trying to build these coalitions broad coalitions, including civil society groups, to really defend democracy, to talk about the values and ideas. And that that's the difficult thing because the Philippine, the Korea, South Korea was our biggest, you know, I think success story in that sense. And, you know, for India, it's just the classic polarizing strategy um, used by, by Modi leading to democratic erosion, uh, democratic hegemony. And I was distressed on India to hear that the opposition is reciprocating in terms of using the religion card um, and that, you know, they, they have little success in forming uh, a united opposition, which is the second strategy that we normally recommend is uniting the opposition. Uh, but I'm wondering if the any of the opposition actors, either parties or society are again, trying to defend democracy in their narratives or not, or just falling completely into the reciprocating, demonizing kind of strategies. And um, on Thailand, no, sorry, uh, and Philippines, we heard about Philippines, to me, there, there's no evident political polarization in the society. The society doesn't seem to be divided. As he said, you know, Duterte had very high approval ratings. Now Marcos Jr. has, you know, high vote intention. But instead, 
we have democratic erosion without a clear polarization um, of society. And it seems to be more of an intra-elite rivalry and has been intra-elite you know, competition for many years. Um, and so, so that, you know, I think takes a different strategy and it's probably going to have to, if the elites aren't willing to, to do it, um, to defend democracy, then, you know, it's going to have to come from civil society. And so definitely the disinformation checks are very important, but is there any broader movement to focus on, um, you know, to really, to really focus on the, uh, democratic principles as a narrative as well. And then finally, Thailand, again, you know, a very classic case of the polarization that we talked about. The protest mobilization being relatively equal, but otherwise using very different capacities, electoral votes on one side versus the institutional strength on the other side of the military and the courts and the, and the bureaucracy. And so that is the toughest because of course they went the furthest in terms of democratic collapse um, but it's somewhat encouraging to hear, you know, some change in public opinion that perhaps there can be a movement um, toward. And I would just suggest there, um, you know, it's going to be a slow movement toward changing and probably generational change to try to get political legitimacy toward not rejecting necessarily the monarchy, but, you know, building toward more popular sovereignty. Um, as as authority, but I really appreciated um, hearing the updates on all of these countries and and the possibilities um, that they pose, as well as the challenges. Thank you very much, Professor McCoy. Among four uh, panelists, anyone who would like to respond to Jennifer's comment? I, I would Yasa? like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, what uh, uh, Professor Marquez said about India, especially Modi, uh, is, uh, uh, is actually uh, the, uh, today the uh, dilemma in India is that uh, uh, we, uh, we, in the entire opposition space, you know, uh, we do not have actually a kind of, you know, uh, a leader who can really match, uh, you know, Modi's uh, kind of, you know, charisma or popularity. Uh, so that's one major, you know, shortfall. You know, like we have opposition, uh, the oldest party, uh, Nas National Congress, and uh, uh, Mr. Rahul Gandhi for last uh, ten years. But he's still not, you know, no match actually to uh, Mr. Modi in any sense. You know, in terms of uh, his mobilizational, you know, sort of uh, uh, tactics, his uh, uh, broad appeal to you know uh, different sections of the populations, and then. His brand Hindutva, you know, that he has uh, nurtured for last 20 years as the, uh, you know, chief minister of uh, uh, Gujarat state, from where he actually built that image, you know, as as uh, someone who is unapologetic, you know, sort of uh, Hindutva leader, uh, and 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 in a sense he's uh, also a bachelor. Uh, he's not corrupt. Uh, he he maintains a very disciplined life. You know, that actually appeals with the masses. It goes very well with the masses. They see that you know he has he has no sort of uh, dynasty because the Congress party opposition party is always you know put as a dynasty party, you know a party which uh, has origin from the uh, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, Indira Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi. You know this is like fourth generation party. So in a sense that uh, that's a major dilemma. And then second thing is about also that uh, uh, major problem that we face today is that uh, uh, that asymmetry, that huge asymmetry that exists between. Uh, uh, the ruling party and the oppositions. Uh, you know, that in terms of number, what uh, Sukjung said about the, it's not just about the numbers, you know, like uh, the main opposition has just 10% of what, you know, the ruling party has got in terms of, you know, uh, the member of parliament. It's about the money also, uh, that uh, political funds, you know, that you need also to put up a good campaign to run party, to run political activities. So Congress doesn't even get one tenth of, you know, what the BJP is getting. So that's where also that's reflected very poorly also in terms of you know putting up a effective campaign. So so uh, and the third is about the electoral machine. You know BJP has over the years put up a massive electoral machine, massive massive propaganda machine. They have thousands of people working full time. You know just to message. You know on WhatsApp, on Facebook, on any social media space. They are just 
uh, uh, saturate, over saturated everything. So in a sense that uh, no, none of these opposition parties, especially the major opposition parties are able to, some of the regional parties are fighting it out, you know, very well. In fact, uh, in Delhi, the national capital, a new political party led by Ahmadi party, Mr. Arvind Kejriwal, has been, you know, uh, uh, defeating Modi for last 10 years, left and right. Uh, even Mamta Banerjee in the, uh, you know, Bengal, West Bengal, uh, defeated uh, Narendra Modi in the election, left and right. So some of those regional leaders who have their charisma and they connect with the masses are able to check uh, this party. But then you cannot get all of them together and you know, put a united front end because their division is so sharp and they fight also against each other. So that's a uh, you know tragic uh, situation where we are placed today. Okay. Sanjira? Um, I, I would try to be short because I can see that we're running out of time here. Um, I, I think that um, it, it is important to remind ourselves that polarization is a very dynamic phenomenon, right? And I think it has pretty much to do with power and hegemony, like Professor Jennifer just said. And I think, um, particularly in the case of Thailand, you can see that the dynamic has, has um, gradually shifted, um, although painfully. And I, I think it is also important to keep in mind that um, those who support democracy also have a role to play in overcoming um, polarization by basically uh, bridging the gap, reaching out to the other side of the aisle and perhaps try to understand where they're coming from and why they mistrust democracy um, as such. And I think with that basic understanding of um, uh, mistrust in democratic institutions, then you can start to build consensus towards democracy from the ground up. And I think that um, it is challenge a challenging and, and a daunting task in, in countries, especially in the US or, or, or countries with really severe polarization. But I think it is important for pro-democracy forces to actually build a broad-based alliance that includes people from the other side of the aisle. Thank you very much. You know, it was very fascinating to listen to this uh, very interesting dynamics in four countries. Uh, for me, my, my take is that if I look at the interaction between elite uh, political entrepreneurs and, and the mass ordinary people, the civil society, I think the alignment between two levels uh, I can find in the case of Thailand and also in South Korea, and and also th these two camps. I think they are more uh, their power and influence is uh, symmetrical, uh, so can be uh, better in a sense than um, Indian case where the the. Uh, the, the the parliament is under the the, uh, the, the political uh, leader uh, who is trying to push for the polarization. But unfortunately, in Thailand, uh, you have uh, all this military and uh, uh, his intervention in the typical normal business of a democracy. That's that's uh, unfair and tragic. And I think a Philippine. I think uh, you have a hope because you know even the Duterte's party is, uh, is controlling less than uh, fifths of your seats, but it's a very strange system because even though you have seven or eight parties, uh, they can support the president or they can oppose president. So you know the majority bloc supporting president. Uh, ended up as a huge, even though the party itself is small. So it's very, um, very uh, unique case. So I wish you all the best in your coming election in May. Uh, you know, you can have a more democratic uh, vision uh, in the future. Um, it was fascinating. And, and, and Professor Jennifer McCoy, I, I wish you all the best to your coming book about the depolarizing, um, the political polarization and uh, restudy uh, of your coming your book. Thank you very much, uh, Professor McCoy and uh, Chung Kim and Francis Nagano, Niranjan Saho and Janjira uh, Sombat. And uh, we'll try to, to uh, provide uh, another chance to discuss this fascinating topic. Thank you very much. Thank you.